I continue now uh, in this video with a discussion of uh, female perform uh, solo performers. Uh, I wanted to devote a little attention to um, Anna Devere Smith, uh, who um, created in the 1990s uh, one of the most uh, successful and powerful solo performances uh, in the entire time span in which uh, which this course covers. Uh, that was in 1992 when she uh, produced a performance piece called uh, Fires in the Mira. And I've asked you to look at uh, this uh, performance, the video of it, on YouTube. Uh, it's a kind of movie of of her performance uh, and staged in a way that takes advantage of the video uh, capabilities. Uh, but uh, it began as a solo work, remains a solo work, and uh, continues to be a reference point, you might say, in the history of solo performance. Uh, Anna Devere Smith um, was unique in the way she developed her performance. Uh, the work itself is based on actual events that occurred in Crown Heights, Brooklyn in 1991 uh, when an accident occurred in uh, uh, a section of Brooklyn uh, shared by uh, African Americans and Jews. A car carrying a, a, a Jew to um, the Jewish sector of Crown Heights, or next to Crown Heights, uh, accidentally hit uh, a little African-American boy, and the accident, at the very moment it happened in this uh, black neighborhood, precipitated a great deal of social unrest which led to rioting when the police arrived and uh, the um, Jews attempted to protect, it, protect the Jewish driver and his um, and the other occupants in the car from a very restless mob of African Americans who felt that the police uh, were not taking the accident as seriously as they ought to uh, in their relations with the with the, with the um, uh, Jewish uh, people in the car. Uh, so the social upheaval that resulted from this accident uh, achieved national headlines, so people throughout the country were aware of this profound racial tension between Jews and blacks. And uh, Anna Devere Smith wanted to understand better how this conflict uh, functioned and how it, how it operated, so to speak. So she interviewed all kinds of people who had some connection with the Crown Heights incident, uh, Jews and blacks. And uh, she studied the people she interacted with, and it was not just people who were at the accident scene, but people who uh, claimed to represent uh, one side or the other, or to speak about one side or the other. Uh, or, or had some passionate statement to make about the incident uh, to clarify why they were angry or uh, distressed uh, by the incident. As a result of, of interviewing uh, 
such a wide range of people and studying their not only what they said but their gestures, their tone of voice, the way they dressed, the way they moved and responded to um, uh, questions that she had asked. She, she impersonated all of these these people who actually lived and she didn't write any of the statements that they made for them. She used their words and spoke them as if she were these persons that she had interviewed, male and female, white and black, uh, old and young. And uh, her solo performance involved a sequence uh, of these uh, impersonations of different people and their relation to the Crown Heights incident. You can see all of this in the video. But what's remarkable about the performance is that she did not depend on her own language to explain uh, the, the incident. She relied on the language of those who were there, who actually lived, and she did an astounding job of impersonating them and getting inside of the people who made these statements about the Crown Heights incident. It was a phenomenal piece of acting. Uh, Anna Devere Smith had studied acting in a small college and um, and then had uh, gotten some parts on uh, Broadway and off-Broadway uh, shows, but she never found herself as an actress until she began to organize the roles she wanted to play, and these roles were given by history, so to speak, historical figures, living figures, that she absorbed into herself and made a part of her being, and you might say the message of Fires in the Mirror is that people cannot escape their racial identity and the constricted view of the world that results from, from a deep attachment to their racial identity until they actually try to be someone outside of their racial identity, outside of their age group, outside of their sex. And that's a profound uh, way of looking at acting, that the resolution of social conflicts depends upon some latent dormant capacity of people to act, to impersonate to become some other person than themselves and be able to see the world from that other perspective. Uh, it's not the kind of solo performance that, uh, that Spalding Gray or Bogosian or Karen Finley or Sarah Bernhardt or Margaret Cho or Laurie Anderson pursued uh, in, as, as a way of opening up awareness of self. Uh, Anna Devere Smith saw the self as composed of all these, of a society. A society inhabits our bodies, and that society consists of people across the spectrum of, of, of demographic identities, you might say, across different racial, uh, ethnic, um, uh, sexual, and, and, and um, temporal age uh, identities um, and we cannot have a healthier more prosperous society without being able to acknowledge these other selves within us these fires in the mirror so to speak when we look into the mirror and see this 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 flame of other being who, uh, that flares up when you have a crisis, an incident, when racial identities come into violent conflict with each other as a result of an accident, a misunderstanding, a failure to 
look where you're going uh, when crossing from one territory to no. another. So that's why I've asked you to look at uh, Anna Devere Smith as kind of uh, milestone, you might say, in the evolution of solo performance. Uh, she has gone on uh, to do subsequent solo performances in this vein, Twilight, um, Los Angeles, uh, is also made into a movie as a similar project in which uh, she dealt with the Rodney King riots of 1992 uh, through this process of interviewing persons who had something to say about the riots and then impersonating those persons um, in this very skillful way of changing her costume and her makeup and hair and mask and so forth. So that's been her style. Although this kind of performance has um, allowed her to uh, perform roles in films and television with the, with the success of Fires in the Mirror, she's had a regular supply of opportunities to perform in film and, um, and television. For the most part, she remains a, an academic, a professor of theater arts at uh, New York University right now. She used to be at Stanford, but uh, uh, she travels very comfortably in academic circles, uh, as well as in the um, uh, professional entertainment industry in um, Hollywood. Uh, so uh, please see Anna Devere Smith's Fires in the Mirrors through, uh, you access it through the um, Canvas website, which has the links to its uh, seven or eight parts to it, and little segments, and witness the astonishing diversity of, of roles or characters, identities that uh, she is able to uh, present in the in the performance. This kind of metamorphosis of of her being into this kind of society that inhabits her body. Want to talk also about solo performance that really does focus uh, exclusively on the body. Uh, all of the solo performers I've talked about so far have relied on language in some way, even if, as in Laurie Anderson, it's to uh, depress the significance of language, but nevertheless, she acknowledges it through her songs and distortion, electronic distortions of her voice. Uh, and tries to show how we can and drain language of all of its viral capacities. But you don't need language at all to create vibrant uh, solo performance. That was a feature of the modern dance culture uh, running alongside of contemporary theater during the 80s and 90s. Uh, and connected in some way to performance art uh, as well. But much of solo performance uh, from, the, from the 90s onwards came out of the dance world in which performers wanted to abandon language altogether or push the the aesthetics of, of uh, Julian Beck, the Living Theater, and, and Grotowski in the, the Theater Lab to its obvious conclusion, which is let's create a message, a communication that doesn't require the voice at all, especially if um, performers want to reach a global audience where spectators use different languages. So I've asked you to look at video clips of, of different uh, performers from different countries who rely entirely on the body uh, to create interest and to engage audiences. Diana Vishneva is a Russian dancer. Yang Li Ping is a Chinese uh, dancer. Uh, also Shailen Bourne, did an astonishing 
uh, ice skating, uh, ice dance for Olympic competition uh, using the tango music, La Comparsita as accompaniment. But she does a really astounding piece all by herself on an ice rink in which she dances with a chair and moves that chair around. It's like an intense erotic confrontation or, in, uh, or, or dialogue with an inanimate object. Uh, Vishneva uses this kind of strange umbrella or parasol-like hat uh, and veil uh, to uh, build a dance out of out of this kind of strange veiling of her of her body, and Yang Li Ping in her moon dance relies entirely on her silhouette against the backdrop of a huge glowing moon. Uh, to produce her work. These are short pieces. It takes a lot of choreographic imagination to sustain the interest of audiences in the body alone over a period of time lasting more than five minutes. Uh, one thing that the solo performers who use language had understood. They, they aren't going to engage audiences unless they in some way speak to them and use language to uh, organize their thinking about the performance. With the solo body uh, uh, free of language, uh, you have less time uh, or less patience, you might say, with the audience. Uh, to make the performance relevant. It's very difficult to develop the solo body without language unless the physicality of the dance becomes more complex, more explicit, and has a increasingly complex relation to technology and sound. And that remains, for, from my perspective, the most challenging aspect of solo performance where the uh, solo performer must rely entirely on the body as the projection of the self. Uh, and the longer one relies on the body to project the self, the more one, the performer, needs to um, increase, uh, expand the relation uh, of the body to um, some kind of interaction with technology uh, and an external stimuli like music. Uh, but I do want you to look at these these brief uh, solo performance body oriented uh, uh, examples from Diana Vishneva, Lang, Lang, uh, Yang Li Ping, and uh, Shailin Bourne uh, to see the diversity of solo performance with the body, the the degree to which these performances depend on a very a uh, brief time span in which to reach their completion, their fulfillment. If they are to go anywhere, they must involve a more complex relation to technology, visual stimuli of, of the scene, and the body's um, expressivity. That remains a major, major challenge of solo performance even for those who do rely on language, it's becoming evident that solo performers have great difficulty, even if they're relying on language, to go more than one hour in length. In the comedy club world, 
they they start out by no, doing no more than 10 minutes or so and then build up but it's increasingly difficult for performers today to match the success of performers in earlier decades like Robin Williams or Richard Pryor uh, who could go on for an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, uh, all alone on stage, making people laugh and bringing them into some kind of, of um, as with Spalding Gray, labyrinth of stories or narratives. Solo performance now requires a much more intense experience than ever before and how performers can do that uh, remains a major challenge of what once was a big frontier full of promise and opportunity and excitement. Uh, I did want to mention Kazuo Ono uh, as an interesting example of solo performance who predates the time that the course focuses on. Uh, he was in the Bhutto culture, which I've already mentioned uh, in previous videos and in a subsequent video I will discuss in greater detail. But he was always a solo performer, even though he was a great influence on the Bhutto movement as a whole. He uh, studied in Germany in the 1930s and then in Japan. In Tokyo after World War II, he wanted to apply what he had learned in Germany through the German uh, modern dance movement, which was very expressionistic, um, to a distinctly Japanese kind of performance that was at the same time modern and not to be associated with the traditional forms of Japanese performance in No and Kabuki and, and Bugaku, Bunraku. But he felt he could only do that alone by himself because the resources were not available to develop a new kind of theater that could apply um, what he had learned uh, in Germany and what was in him to communicate to audiences from his Japanese heritage. So he began performing alone in this thing called Buto and his performances evolved over many decades and he adopted different personas sometimes he embodied personas of ambivalent sexual identity it wasn't clear whether it was a male or a female sometimes clearly a female a kind of transvesticism in his performance and sometimes some kind of strange maleness. Uh, but um, uh, he would develop a different kind of rhythm of performance that uh, involved, if it involved a voice, it involved a kind of incatory, operatic kind of voice that came out of him but wasn't uh, lucid. It was, a, it was a, 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 a kind of cry coming out of him. But for the most part, he moved in this mysterious way, uh, uh, inhabiting a, either a theater space uh, as if it were some kind of ritual zone where, uh, whereby uh, some kind of mysterious archaic and at the same time distinctly modern way of moving unfolded and I suppose he was closest to Laurie Anderson in his aesthetic except that he wasn't deeply interested in the body's transformation through technology he was much more interested in the body's transformation through uh, a kind of um, reorganization of, of the movements people make to accomplish simple tasks like walking across the room 
or lifting an object from a table or seeing something in the sky or gazing into a mirror or putting something into a pocket or um, approaching uh, an animal or uh, lifting a plate, um, opening a book, uh, studying one's hand, um, putting on a piece of clothing or uh, adjusting some object on the uh, before one, like you know, moving, uh, say a feather that one has found, and putting it next to a seashell. So it's all these simple gestures that people perform. They don't even know they're performing them. Sometimes they just do them. But he would take these gestures and do something with them fetishize them or, or make them some kind of mysterious event. And uh, he would combine all of such, such gestures as I've described and it would be uh, like a very mysterious dance. It unfolded slowly and then something rapid would happen and then it would slow down uh, and then have these different rhythms to it. It was uh, a really remarkable accomplishment, and many people wanted to study with Kazuo Ono. Uh, so he had many students who then became the leaders and members of the Buto groups that flourished uh, after the 1960s and the 1970s, and then 80s, and they really, Buto's now really big in Japan. but. Kajua Ono represented the, the primordial model, so to speak, of the Buto artist who has this kind of monkish dedication to austere simplicity of movement and gesture, but also a kind of heightening of it uh, so that we see how strange our actions are, simple actions are, in, in the world and how important they are. How if we study them and look at them, we see the world differently than we did before the performance. Ono was not really interested in performing in theaters uh, as such. He didn't mind performing in all kinds of places. He was not, this, this kind of performance I've described was not something he wanted contained entirely within the theater. So he often just performed wherever he wanted to, on the street, in public places. People invited him to perform near them in some place that, that they control, like in an apartment or, or, or uh, a house or um, he, he would perform in, on the docks of uh, harbors, harbor docks, or in parks. And sometimes he would just show up and just do something. He had little interest in money. Most of the money he earned came from students that he had. And sometimes he wasn't all that diligent about charging the students if he was interested in what they were doing, or the students had difficulty paying him. And um, it's kind of a mystery as to how he survived so long. And he had a long career. He was performing into his 90s. Really amazing. Uh, and then when he was old, he had to, he, he could only get around in a wheelchair, and yet he continued to perform. He, he still commanded an art. People found this mysterious figure of indefinite sex uh, fascinating uh, because of the way he was able to make the most simple or movements that the body can make into extraordinary dramatic dances. 
so Kazuo Ono represents this connection of contemporary theater to an older part of the history of modern drama dating back from after World War II when he began. His style evolved as he became more and more sophisticated about um, the way he could incorporate and narrativize to put into a kind of sequence these different this different combinations of movements. He had one dance performance using a parasol or umbrella, opening it up, raising it to the sky, his eyes, and then moving across the stage and I mean doing things with this parasol that seemed amazing. Um, and anybody could practice doing it, take a long time to do it as well as he did, but he understood the profound potential inherent in the human interaction with objects, even when we're alone. And he was always representative of a figure of the aloneness of humanity. That we are alone in the world with objects and alone in relation to others. That aloneness needs to be performed and revealed. And when it is revealed, our identity becomes less certain than we think it is in relation to society and groups and others who shape our identity. It becomes more ambiguous and more uncertain. 